Join us on the next Prairie Sportsman as we cut some holes and go sight fishing for rainbow trout with Garrett Sphere from Slab Seeker Fishing. We'll also visit the Minnesota DNR Southeast Trout Fisheries and see how they use natural cold water springs to sustain their hatcheries and protect Minnesota's trout population. And we'll join Nicole Zempel for a fast forage. Welcome to Prairie Sportsman, I'm Brad Amundsen. We got a great show for you this week and it starts right now. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, and by Mark and Margaret yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farm, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org, and by Live Wide Open, and Western Minnesota Prairie Waters. He's back. He's got it in his mouth right now. There you go. Nice. <laughs> Sight fishing rainbow trout. It doesn't get any better, buddy. Winter in Minnesota. It's easy for people to cozy up to a fire or maybe move down south for a few months. But for the throng of anglers who wait for lakes to freeze up each year, this is paradise. Today we're out with Garrett Sveer from Slab Seeker Fishing to target rainbow and brown trout and we're going to do it in a way that it's arguably the most exciting method possible. Lens is a little fogged up but we just got in here, just got set up and you were marking fish immediately Garrett. Right away I dropped down there and I had one, he didn't hit it, he kept bumping it with his head and so I never seen the wax worm disappear. I can just barely make out my jig. But that's a good sign there's a few around today. While we will be using electronics. Garrett augered out holes big enough for us to look through that clear water to see a fisher down there chasing our bait around. How deep are we? We're set up in 10 feet of water here and we're fishing about halfway down the water column. And that seems to be kind of the deal there. About halfway down you get their attention from out in that deeper water. We're set up on a main lake point here where it drops real steep so we're in 10 feet but if you were to take a step out the door you'd be in 20 out there. It's, we're really on a steep break line which seems to be my most high percentage spots on these trout lakes. When you told me about sight fishing for these fish like I was envisioning a big like a big spear hole basically that we're a big rectangle that we're going to be looking down but that's not what we got here. You know I, we have and we can do that too. Um, I had a guy that was helping me for a while a few years back and uh, we were every morning uh, doing an ice saw drilling four holes and then connecting them and then spinning the big chunk of ice underneath. I went back to grab customers at the truck and he fell in trying to spin that. Oh no. So I came back to him in the hole holding oh, onto boy. the edge um, and so that kind of freaked me out. So I haven't been doing the spear hole as much <laughs> in the morning just uh, because of wrestling that big ice block. But yeah, we, we definitely do that. It works great too. I've been kind of clover leafing these. I think I drilled four for you. We're kind of employing a one-two punch here. I've got this bigger spoon on, and you just have a small tungsten on? Yeah, just a little tungsten jig with a wax worm. So a lot of times you can call them in with one of them with a the big with the bigger spoon, and then the, the smaller tungsten will catch these fish. And that's common with a lot of species, I think. But uh, depending on how aggressive the bite is, uh, will determine which one of those two presentations they end up they end up going after. Exactly. Oh, I just missed one. Just had one come and miss it. There he is, got him. Nice. <laughs> so this fish, there he is right here. Oh, it's a pike. Oh, it's a pike. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, little pike. So I just saw the flash and that's the beauty of sight fishing is he came in and, and missed it. And I saw the flash and I got excited so I jigged it a little more and he came in and, and smashed it. And yeah, not the target species, but you know what? Catching fish is catching fish and seeing them is, is even that much more fun. So. Absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately we do get a few, oh, here's a big trout, big trout down there. Come on, come on. Oh, he's losing interest. I have such a hard time with that. I know I've got a couple of buddies that they won't fish with anything but a tungsten, uh, at least for 
you know, primarily panfish, bluegills, sure. perch, whatever. But I'm a spoon guy, man. I love something big and noisy and flashy down there. Uh, a lot of times I get outfished. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with these though, they're charged up. That's a pretty good plan. I mean, they're pretty aggressive fish. I, I think that's my biggest problem though, is I like, I like to fish, you know, yeah. even, even up on a place like Lake of the Woods where dead sticks are so effective or walleye fishing when that real subtle, small light presentation does so well. I hate it. Like, I want to jig. Want to be jigging. Yeah, yeah. me too. That's what happens when there's a lot going on and all of a sudden I saw him marked real high and before I could even get the camera going, he came up and smoked it and I knew I was going to drop him <laughs> and yeah. We got him. We got him. <laughs> nice go. catch. <laughs> so he's not a giant, but this is a stocked lake so it's put and take really. So they encourage harvest of these fish. You can keep five of them in Minnesota and uh, great on the smoker, really good on the grill. You can pan yeah. fry them. So we'll give you a better look at them there if we can focus nice there's our first one Garrett dinner fish buddy hell yeah throw this guy back Oof. here just put him anywhere they're not easy <laughs> to hold is one thing that's what I love about them though <laughs> that's what makes them so much fun to catch because when when you realize when you hold one just how strong they are when they squirm back and forth like that <laughs> that's right. what they're doing though on there when they hook up with you exactly the best way to land them, you did that perfect, is instead of trying to grab them when they're thrashing in the hole, is just to slide them up on the ice and then grab them because uh, it seems like you can never get a hold of them in the hole like that. Oh, I got one down here. Yes, yeah, I just marked one again. Yeah. I was going to show you what I was using, but then I marked a fish. <laughs> And they usually do come in little packs like that too. There'll be little groups of them. Oh, that yeah, I got through. one on me right now. Oh yeah, there he is. He's chasing it, huh? Yeah. You can see him on your Vexler. It's so much fun to be able to watch him down there and sight fish these trout, Garrett. Oh, he just missed it again. <laughs> oh, I had him too. Here he is. Yeah, I think I lost him. I got him on here. This is a better one here. Not huge, but better. Oh yeah. Just kamikazes, aren't they? Isn't that fun? So much. And then fun. the best scenario is just to kind of slide them up on the ice here next to you, and that way you don't. If I try to grab them in the hole, I lose 100% of these fish. <laughs> <laughs> but there he is. I'll tell you, that's oh, what I. Down. You know what I kind of like about these fish is when they're aggressive, they hit on just about everything. Nice fish right there, Garrett. And well, then I'm glad. To, I'm glad I got one. You were kind of putting the, the <laughs> screws to me at first this way. Yeah. <laughs> Let's show show people what you're using there. I just have this little tungsten jig on. We were trying to do kind of a one-two punch, so it's just a little tungsten fly with a little hair on the back. Then I'm tipping that with a wax worm. And uh, I told Brett we needed small, and he said, this spoon catches everything. And he was right. <laughs> He's seen 10 times more fish than I have this morning with that spoon. I'll tell you what, this Al's Goldfish, am I getting a focus on it? I can't, oh yeah, there we go. It's got this bent shape to it and this big shiny gold color to it. And I didn't know much about Al's Goldfish Lure Company. And then I got introduced to him up at Lake of the Woods and we put on this 49er and it caught all our fish. I, I tried a couple of different lures right away, Garrett. Once I switched to this one, I didn't take it off the entire the, the rest of the day. Fishing. Everybody else that was catching fish all caught it on it. So company's been around for 70 years. Has it really? They're from out east and they actually make lures that are coated in 22 karat gold. Wow. This one's not, this is just a gold color. But uh, if it catches fish, I don't care what it's coated on. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> He's on it. Oh, he's right on it. You got him. You got him. <laughs> All right. <laughs> nice. You know, I dropped down to the bottom where you said the fish were. <laughs> <laughs> You're fighting with uh, the spoon for me, and then I just uh, got in the zone, and he came over and ate it. I feel like anytime I fish with an underwater camera or sight fish like we are today, my life changes <laughs> because you get a glimpse of what you're actually doing down there. You can see your action of your jig or lure or spoon, whatever you're using. And if you're lucky, you can see how the fish react to it. And sometimes it's good to see what you're doing down there and react. And sometimes it's better just to not pay attention. I was just responding to a text there. I got a fish and what that tells us 
even when you think you're not learning anything, you're learning something. So when I'm looking down the hole, I'm probably over jigging it today. Because as soon as I stopped to answer a text message, I got bit in like three seconds. Hmm. So if you're ever on a guide trip with me and you see me texting, I'm just trying to learn <laughs> 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 what the fish are wanting. When it comes to trout fishing in Minnesota, make sure you pay attention to the regs because there's different rules and season dates in different areas of the state. Keep five of these, but only three of the five can be over 16 inches. So I was just telling Brett, we got a, we got four, but we need to get some of these overs. I'd like him to at least see a couple of the bigger ones. Yeah, for sure. Actually, I have seen a couple of the bigger ones. I had one on <laughs> briefly, but. Uh, you had one job, Garrett. Uh, yeah. So we're looking at the backside of winter here, backside of ice fishing, and we're seeing plenty of fish. I don't know, I always hear when you go down towards the metro and a lot of those lakes, they get fished out right after a winter trout opener. So, and I always hear about a lot of those metro lakes after the first week, you might as well not even bother. Mm -hmm. I haven't fished on there, but it's always kind of a surprise to me because, um, you know, here in central Minnesota, uh, the few lakes that, that we have here for trout, they produce fish throughout the whole season. I mean, it, it gets, a lot of times towards the end of March, it, fishing can get really super good for them, almost the best bite of the whole winter. Seeing under the ice is like seeing into a different world and seeing how fish are actually reacting to what you're doing is just gonna make you a better angler and you're gonna have a lot more fun. And trout are the perfect species for sight fishing because of their aggressive nature. He's back, he's back, he's on it. You see him? Oh, he had it in his mouth. He's back. He's got it in his mouth right now. There you go. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sight fishing rainbow trout. It doesn't get any better, buddy. Heck yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Love it. So that fish came in. And we just had a dead stick down while I was filming and I was watching it and I had the camera right on it because I wanted to film like, our perspective. Yeah, yeah. sight fish in these rainbows. I wanted to get it with the camera. So all of a sudden I saw this rainbow come in. I hit the record button. He it, ate it, spit it out, came back, ate it, spit it out. And then I realized I wasn't recording anyway. <laughs> so I'm like, Garrett, get over here, grab this rod. If he comes back, you're gonna set the, set the hook on this fish. He came back and uh, we got the whole thing. So there is your sight fishing for rainbow trout experience. What do you call it? Bow fishing of ice fishing? Yeah, it's hunting. like the bow hunting bow, of ice fishing. You gotta get hunting. that close to him. Well, nice job, buddy. Hey, thanks man, that was awesome. Approximately 5,000 gallons per minute run from these springs year round. The cold, clean water flows through raceways for rainbow trout broodstock, raised to three years old. That contains a chemical compound that's actually used in our aspirin. Minnesota trout thrive in deep cold water lakes in the north and in clear spring-fed streams in the southeast, where groundwater flows through porous limestone. The Minnesota DNR raises trout in those cold, clean waters. We have four cold water hatcheries in Minnesota. One is near Emily, Minnesota. That's Spire Valley Hatchery. We have three down in the southeast down here. It's the Peterson State Fish Hatchery, the Lanesboro Hatchery, and the Crystal Springs Hatchery. We each produce a little bit different species of fish or different strains of fish of trout. But each have about 48 degree water, so perfect for rearing trout. The Peterson Hatchery produces about 40,000 lake trout and 100,000 splake annually for northern Minnesota. These lake trout are more of a cold, deep water lake or lake fish. So they like a little depth and dark and cold. The splake trout is a combination hybrid of a lake trout and a brook trout. The Minnesota biologists can use that as a tool 
in different locations, different habitats. We stock lakes around uh, the Hinkley area, Brainerd area, Grand Rapids, International Falls, and Grand Marais. When the ice comes off the lake, you've got a certain amount of time until some of those lakes that we're stocking into, the surface temperatures are going to be up in the 70s. And when we have 48 degree water all year round, we got to try to get it up there early spring when the, when the water is about 48 degrees on top of the water when those ice, the ice goes off. And then those fish can get down to the colder water down below before it heats up on top. The Peterson Hatchery has also started raising a native brook trout strain called Minnesota Driftless, a heritage trout. The DNR did some genetic testing and determined that this strain is historically uh, true to Minnesota. We've determined what streams have that genetics and we've gone in every year for the past three years now to get the gametes or the eggs and uh, produce our own broodstock. They will go mainly in the southeast rivers, southeast Minnesota rivers. Once abundant in southeast Minnesota, brook trout populations plummeted during settlement times when hillsides were logged for row crop production and cattle grazing. Streams filled in with sediment and became wider, shallower, warmer, and not favorable to brook trout. Brown trout brought in from Germany fared better. The brown trout can live a little bit more in harsh conditions, warmer waters, bigger waters. The brook trout like it a little more clear and cold. While native brook trout populations are coming back, browns are still raised for streams where they adapt better than brookies. And for put and take fisheries, such as Southwest Minnesota streams, where large fish are stocked for spring fishing. The State Fish Hatchery in Lanesboro raises about 370,000 brown trout annually, as well as 300,000 rainbows. Fish get stocked all throughout the state of Minnesota. Oftentimes we stock fish to create a fishery for, you know, a certain season, like, uh, you know, in the springtime or winter fisheries have become a very popular option. That they, we know they won't reproduce and proliferate in those areas, but it creates a fishery for a period of time that seems to be very popular. A lot of brown, the brown trout we stock here actually get stocked in streams in the southeast as fingerlings. Most of the yearling rainbow trout we produce, the catchable size rainbow trout we produce, get stocked in lakes throughout the state. There's a lot of natural reproduction of brown trout in streams in the southeast. We don't know of any natural reproducing rainbow trout in, in southeast Minnesota. And so that's why we produce all the rainbow trout in a hatchery and stock those out as catchable size fish. Welcome to the Lanesboro State Fish Hatchery. This hatchery has been a part of the southern Minnesota landscape for over 70 years. Before becoming a hatchery, this land was used as a grist mill. Land for the Lanesboro Hatchery was purchased by the state in 1926 and expanded over the years. A major renovation of Minnesota's largest cold water hatchery was completed in 2021. The old hatchery, the infrastructure was failing. The beams, the, the frame, the beams were rusting all the way through and it was in danger of collapsing. Also, there needed to be improvements to the water quality going into the nursery. One of the most important parts of the new hatchery construction was the degassing tower. The degassing was needed to remove dissolved radon and nitrogen and add back oxygen to improve the water quality for the incubating eggs and the first life stages of the fish. This is one of uh, two springs that are in the area that feed water, spring water to the hatchery. Approximately 5,000 gallons per minute run from these springs year round. 
The cold, clean water flows through raceways for rainbow trout broodstock, raised to three years old. The adults will then spawn about a million eggs before retiring to Minnesota lakes. Fertilized eggs are disinfected and transferred into an incubation room. Each lot of eggs comes in once a week and then that incubates for about a month before it gets transferred out. The two species spawn at different times, so which works out really well for our operation. Brown trout start spawning in September, rainbow trout start spawning in October. The nursery area is where the eggs actually hatch. They stay in there until they're on feed and they grow in there for a period of time until they outgrow those tanks. Fish get transferred out of the nursery in about April when they move outside. This is one of our fingerling production ponds that have uh, about 260,000 rainbow trout growing in it. Uh, so this pond will get stocked with fingerlings in the summer, about mid-July, and then gets harvested in the springtime, April and May. In the wild, brown trout like to hide in shade or under rocks, so those fingerlings are raised in closed buildings. They're about eight months old or so, around three or four inches long. Rainbows are a lot easier to raise in a hatchery setting than, than browns are. They, they take well to being handled and being confined in a raceway and also being fed a prepared feed. Harvesting ponds happens in the springtime when ice is melting and lakes are opening up and then they'll be transferred to staging raceways before they get loaded on trucks and distributed throughout the state. This building is where we load most of our fish out of onto our big transport trucks which deliver fish throughout the state. They go to southwest Minnesota, you know, Redwood River and they go up to Grand Marais, Grand Rapids, Bemidji, all over, and then they get distributed in smaller trucks from there. You know, we're rearing uh, quality fish and, and also providing them to the recreational user, you know, the public and especially the kids. It's fun to have the kids get into fishing and be able to catch fish. You get a rod in your hand and to catch a trout, yeah, I think they fight pretty good. If you get kids in at a young age, they're, you know, they're gonna be a lifetime fisherman. Trout hatcheries are important to Minnesotans because they help to create new fisheries, they help to enhance existing fisheries, and create artificial fisheries where there wouldn't be any opportunity for fishing. I'm really excited today to be beside this lovely cottonwood tree along the Minnesota River. People might not realize that cottonwood trees get a very bad rep. If you've ever talked about, you know, the little fluffy, snowy like cotton that flies around in the air in July, or if people have pools and they kind of land in a person's pool, or the, you know, because it's a poplar, their branches break off easily and people might get some of the sticky cottonwood bud film on their vehicle windshields. So all of these things add up to, I think, the cottonwood tree being so undervalued and underappreciated. It's a pretty marvelous tree and I'll tell you why. The entire tree is medicinal and it's edible. And oftentimes people would not look at these buds and think that it would be something that you could eat. That contains a chemical compound that's actually used in our aspirin, proven anti-inflammatory uh, properties, antimicrobial, antibacterial. 
the best time to harvest cottonwood buds is actually during the cooler weather because you don't get the stickiness all over you. I never take the buds directly from the tree. As I mentioned, it is a poplar tree. Branches fall all the time. And usually after a good wind or a storm, you walk around any cottonwood tree and you're gonna see what I call medicine drops all around on, on the ground. So no need to take them off the tree. They're right there on the ground for the picking. And when you're looking at these, like which ones to pick, um, you do want them to be firm to the touch and preferably still kind of a greenish shade. Uh, you can harvest them when they're darker than that. In the winter times, you'll see that often and that's fine too. But this, what I'm holding right here is kind of like primo. These are really good buds. Uh, so what I am gonna do to make the balm or salve is I will go home and I will just simply pluck the buds right from the little branch. I fill a mason jar halfway full with the buds. Then I top the mason jar off with the extra virgin olive oil and I let them soak between six and 12 months. At that time, you can then strain that out and then you can add beeswax on a double boiler to the thickness that you'd like and boom, you have a cottonwood bud salve or balm. And that is excellent for um, achy joints, sore muscles, eczema, any variety of skin conditions, the stuff works wonders on it. Um, also, if you're not feeling well, to kind of rub it on your chest, it's an expectorant as well. So really it's kind of a miracle in a jar and it all comes from the cottonwood tree and their buds. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, and by Mark and Margaret Yakel juline on behalf of Shalom Hill Farm, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org, and by Live Wide Open and Western Minnesota Prairie Waters.